As we said, budget season is always fraught for schools, especially those on the financial edge. Our next guest has made school funding a big part of his agenda. I thought he was on budget committee all this time, but it turns out he wasn't. He was just a big critic of the budget. Now he chairs the Senate Education Committee. It's a pleasure to welcome back to chat box, Vin Gopal. Senator, how you doing, man? Yeah, David, always good to be with you. So what is the big fight uh, uh, on education funding and who's winning and who's losing? Uh, well, look, on education funding, a lot of things have changed since the school funding formula came into law back in 2008, uh, SFRA. I mean, we, we've seen over the last six years that the funding formula just can't be based on uh, enrollment and property values. We've got mental health costs, transportation costs, special education costs. So. Uh, this is the last year of the school funding formula where you have winners and losers, and it needs a full revamping. And, I, and that's going to be a priority, I think, of the committee. And uh, I've spoken to Chairwoman Lampitt on the assembly side, and I, I, I think she feels that there needs to be changes also. Uh, and that, that's my hope. So that's going to be something that uh, the legislature handles, right? Revamping the SFRA? Yeah, I mean, we're going to work uh, collaboratively. Uh, the acting education commissioner, Kevin Deemer, knows the uh, the formula in and out. He's one of the experts on it. Yeah. Um, so I think this is going to be good timing for us to all co come collectively together. The reality is a school district who's losing money now shouldn't be held accountable for decisions made by a school board and superintendent 15 years ago, whether they uh, spent money on a stadium or, or whatever they did at that time. How that should negatively impact kids now doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Yeah, just as a, a matter of formality, how does that get changed, though? Is it a legislative process? Yeah, we're going to go through the legislative process. We're looking to have a hearing very soon, uh, bring stakeholders in. And I think the number one driving factor we got to look at is mental health costs. We've got 600 school districts that all tackle mental health differently. Um, and some have uh, social workers on site, others have third parties, others don't have anything. Um, so we have to look at all that. And, and one of the things that Senate President Sweeney really pushed for that didn't happen after he left and something that I want to carry forward is making sure the state uh, moves extraordinary special education funding 100 percent to the state. Um, a family should not be moving school district to school district, depending on the special ed programs of that district. Does the this is something that uh, Steve Sweeney, you mentioned him, uh, used to talk about a lot was uh, school regionalization. Uh, how much energy is there into that effort? It's there. I mean, we're seeing it. We just saw right here in Monmouth County. I, I worked uh, collaboratively with my colleague on the other side of the aisle, Senator O'Scanlan, uh, to regionalize schools in, in the Bayshore area. Um, it's there. Again, you know, it's the old saying about New Jersey is, is uh, home rule. Everybody loves the idea of consolidation. Yeah. Just don't do it in my backyard, right? And, right. Uh, to, Everybody hates Congress, but they always vote for their own congressperson. It's the same thing here. And I think um, that that's part of the challenge here is trying to understand that there are serious cost savings. And it's something that um, I think that the, that the administration and the governor did focus on early on and something that I hope they, they look at again as they finish out their two years. So, I, you know, I think for people who don't have kids in, in school systems, this can become a little abstract. But... Um, what does it mean when a school uh, has gotten has taken unfair advantage of the formula, a winner uh, and a, a school district that loses? What's what's yeah, the I difference? What does that mean? Yeah, I don't know if anybody is taking an unfair advantage. Uh, if they're gaining, right, probably if bad they're choice gaining, of words, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, of course. If they're gaining funding, their enrollment's going through the roof. And I remember one of the first times I visited Freehold Borough when I became a state senator, they had uh, cardboard uh, cardboard boxes separating their classrooms because the enrollment was through the roof. They didn't have a library in the school. So I think, again, this is the challenge of having 600 individual school districts. And I think we're going to have a unique opportunity in 2024 to get this right. We're going to have one time. This is the end of SFRA. Uh, and SFRA needs a significant amount of changes. We can't have school districts losing uh, five, six, seven, eight million dollars, and, and they have to cut programs. And we know the worst thing that can happen is an increase in classroom sizes. So um, we have to get everyone on par, and everyone has to be uh, doing similar programs and having, uh, you know, you can't have one school that has extraordinary music and art program and the other has absolutely nothing and they're two miles away from each other. And that's one of the focuses I think our committees are going to look at this year. And there's a reliance, of course, always on local taxes. Uh, there was, there's a bill, I, I, I'm not sure what its status is, but that gives some municipalities the opportunity to exceed the local tax uh, rate. Explain that a little bit, if you would. 
Yeah, this is a bill uh, by Senators Wicker. It did pass on a bipartisan vote. So if your school district is losing funding and it's losing significantly um, and uh, the Board of Education for one year only wants to increase that cap, uh, um, and I, the, the residents that came, uh, I believe, was South Brunswick, um, uh, or South Plainfield or South Brunswick, South Brunswick. And, and they came to the committee and there's probably about 30 or 40 parents there. Um, and that's something they want. They, they don't want to, um, bless you, they don't want to lose that. So I think that's going to be um, something that uh, is there, but that's just a Band-Aid. That's not a long-term solution at all. So there's also um, uh, another bill that's out there that's aimed at um, abating the uh, learning loss that started um, during the pandemic and continues uh, to this day. Tell us where that is and where you stand on it. Yeah, Senator, Senator uh, Ruiz has really championed this issue, and she has focused very hard on learning recovery issues. She has a literacy package she just put out. Um, look, we were hoping that high dosage tutoring would play a big role, uh, which was intense tutoring. Um, we put money in the budget. Unfortunately, the Department of Education just uh, only started rolling this out very, very recently. I want to say in December. It should have been rolled out way earlier than that. Um, uh, the governor spoke about it in the state of the state last February or, or, or last January, I'm sorry, um, and or in his budget last February. So th these are uh, – we need to get moving. Uh, kids are behind in the state of New Jersey because of COVID, because of the lack of in-person education in math, reading, uh, writing, and a number of areas. And, and we cannot lose this generation of kids because of uh, the COVID pandemic. And that's what's happening right now. So uh, I applaud Senator Ruiz and every think she's doing. She's leading on this. And uh, I'm hopeful that over the next 12 months, we can really, really put a chip in on combating uh, the learning loss challenges here in the state. You mentioned the budget address. It's coming up on Tuesday. What are you anticipating? Let me check that. What are you hoping to hear from the governor? A focus on NJ Transit. NJ Transit in this state, uh, I was very disappointed with the recent fare hikes. Um, and I, I want to make sure that there is some kind of sustainable funding long term for NJ Transit. Uh, we cannot ask. Uh, it's a re very regressive tax to ask riders uh, to 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 pay more and not get uh, better services. Uh, while we haven't had fare increases in seven years, that's understood. Um, th it's still at the worst time to come. So I hope there's something in the budget as it focuses on NJ Transit and making it what it should be. What the governor said he was going to do back in 2018 uh, was fix NJ Transit if it killed him. So this is important. We have to get this uh, working. We have to create a bigger umbrella around NJ Transit so more people in the state are comfortable using it and ridership increases. Well, as you said, everybody likes talking about it, but nobody wants to do anything about it. What kind of... Uh source can can you suggest are you one of those who believes that the corporate business tax surcharge should be uh reinstated i don't i i think everything should be on the table uh and i if, if uh corporate business tax itself uh, is very wide ranging and affects uh corporations of all sizes um, something more narrow or focused uh, at the very top uh, earners who have had show uh, uh, who've showed record profits. Uh, we've we've had a number of companies to do that. Uh, my one concern with the CBT broadly is that it it captures a lot of folks in that CBT tax, and you've got a lot of medium sized businesses that are that are uh, trying to create a footprint here in the New Jer in New Jersey and grow, and it could negatively impact them. But given the situation we're in and the circumstance we're in, I think you have to put everything on the table. The chairman of the uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, said that he thought it might be a good idea to increase the sales tax in the state as a way of putting even more money into the pot for potentially funding NJ Transit. What do you think of that? I don't love uh, increasing regressive taxes. Those types of taxes affect working class families, the people that are most likely to be paycheck to paycheck, the mo people that are most likely uh, trying to make it work in a very expensive uh, climate with inflation. And I just, I'm not a fan of any type of regressive tax like that. Are we still debating book bans in New Jersey in 2024? That's a thing in your district, yeah? 
it's, I don't know if it's in my district, but it's definitely uh, in the state. And look, I, I try to give a, a well-meaning advice, and, and it's, I shouldn't give it advice to the, to, to the opposing political party, but they just had an election where they got wiped out because they focused on uh, transgender issues in schools and whales and dolphins dying, which they haven't talked about since November 6th. Um, and they lost by one of the largest landslides in a... Uh, in a midterm, uh, if the Republican Party wants to get taken seriously in the state, they should probably focus on taxes and affordability and, and issues that they used to be successful on. And on uh, my friends on my side, I'll say, why are you telling the Republicans this? Mm -hmm. Because it's not good for democracy. We have to bring people back to discussing issues. Um, we don't ban books here. Our books uh, in our libraries, we trust our librarians, we trust our school systems are age appropriate. And if there's a book in there, uh, that's not deemed that made it in there. They will go through the process of removing that book. This is not this is not new all of a sudden uh, in the last uh, one year or two years. But it makes me nervous based on history, based on every aspect of history. When you have any group of residents who are in the habit of pushing to ban books, it's not good. You mentioned political parties, and then we talked about this uh, last week. Um, Monmouth County was at the center of the political universe in the state a couple weeks ago, um, and it turned out to be a good weekend for Andy Kim. Um, how is that race progressing, do you think, right now? Is Andy Kim the front runner? I mean, look, the polls have indicated that he's the front runner, and uh, I don't know if he is the front runner. I think... Uh, I think they're probably even. The first lady enjoys a lot of establishment support and yeah. in North Jersey. A number of those North Jersey chairs have, have come out for her. Uh, it seems like Andy Kim has a lot of, of grassroots support. I, uh, I've known both candidates for a while, and uh, they both have really strong skill sets. I think New Jersey is going to be in good shape no matter who they nominate. Still, still a lot of race to go there. Also a lot of race to go for governor. Uh, real quick, Ras Baraka jumped into the race this week. You know him a little bit. What do you think of, of him as a candidate? Lip Roz has uh, done a great job in Newark. He's a, he's a great orator, great speaker. Uh, looking forward to seeing his platform. Uh, you know, I, I've met with him a couple times now and looking forward to seeing what he runs on and how that is going to directly uh, affect Monmouth County residents, because that's my focus. All right. Good stuff there. Senator Vin Gopal, good to see you, man. Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much. Thanks, David.